Okay, so most of this module is solving um, absolute value equations and graphing absolute values and things like that. However, they do throw a little bit of some extra stuff in there as well, okay? I don't know why it's in the same section in the book, but it is, and that's why I had included it when I was doing the creating the modules. So for the first topic, it just says introduction to solving an absolute value equation. And there are really three different cases that you're going to see, okay? One of the cases is when you have the absolute value equal to zero, when you have the absolute value equal to a positive number, and then when you have the absolute value equal to a negative number, okay? What the numbers are on the right-hand side, does it matter? It just matters whether it's zero, positive, or negative. And what's on the left inside the bars on the left hand side isn't really going to matter either. And you'll see because it's going to change from topic to topic. Okay? They're just going to develop and get harder and harder. So we'll see them transform. But for right now, the thing you need to know is this one is the easiest one. Because immediately as soon as you see this, the answer is no solution. Why is it no solution? Negative. Right. When you take the absolute value of something, what do you always get? Positive. You always get a positive. So can a positive ever equal a negative number? No. No. So that's why the answer to these is always going to be no solution. If you see the bars equal to a negative, immediately you know it's no solution. Okay? So those are the easiest ones because, you know, you don't got to do anything, right? You just recognize and then you're done. <laughs> you know the answer. This one's not so bad either, because the only way for the absolute value of something to equal zero is if what's inside here actually equals zero, right? Because the absolute value of zero is zero. So that means that the only way that that's going to happen is if the inside part is equal to zero. And because the variable is already by itself, this is the answer. You don't have to really do anything with this particular problem. If I've got a bunch of stuff inside the bars, then I probably will have to keep solving, right? But for here, it was just the variable inside the bars, so I'm already done. This other one is a little bit different, okay? Because what could be in here that when I take the absolute value of it, I get positive 3? Positive 1. Not positive 1. The absolute value of 1 is 1, not 3. But the absolute value of 3 is 3, oh, okay. or the absolute value of negative 3 is also positive 3, right? If you take the absolute value of negative 3, this, yeah, it's going to come one out one positive, positive, right? Yeah. Or if I have positive 3 in there, it doesn't matter, it's still positive, positive right? So that inside part could be 3 or the inside part could be negative 3. Now here I'm done. I have two solutions. My solutions are 3 and negative 3, right? But if the inside was not just w, like if it was w minus 5 or 2w or something, I would take that inside and equal it to 3, but then have to keep solving, okay? And then over here, take that same inside, equal it to negative 3, and then have to keep solving that. But this is just an introduction. So we just want to see what happens with the inside with these three different cases. If it's zero, you only have to make it equal to zero. If it's a positive number, you have to set the inside equal to the positive of that number. And you have to set the inside equal to the negative of that number. Okay? And then if you have it the absolute equal to a negative number, then you know it's no solution. So those are the three different cases. We're going to keep seeing them over and over and over, just crazier. Okay? So now we have this next topic. It says solving an absolute value equation problem type 1. I think there's like three or four of them. So we're going to keep practicing. Now, notice that you have the bars, right? And you have a negative. However, you cannot say that it's no solution. Not yet, anyway. Because the difference between all of these problems and the problems before them is that in the problems before them, the absolute value bars were all alone on the left-hand side. Here, I don't have the absolute value bars all alone. I have this negative 6 that's attached to it, right? So in order for me to determine which of those three cases I have, I have to get the bars by themselves first. So how would I do that in this example? Uh, 
add a six to both sides? Not add six. If a number is right outside of like a parentheses, right? Parentheses, brackets, those are grouping mechanisms, right? So are bars. Okay, so you don't divide? Correct. It's like it's multiplying, right? So you do the opposite, divide. So that will get rid of that. I will have my bars and my wall by itself. And then now what number is over there on the right-hand side? Uh, negative 10. Is it negative? Ten, no, I mean 10. It's a positive, positive 10. 10. Sorry, 10. Negative, negative, positive. Yep, you got it. So then now is where I can figure out which case is it. Is it the case where I have a zero, a positive, or a negative? You got a positive. You have a positive. Right. So then you have to take the inside equal to that number exactly or the inside equal to the negative of that number. And since y is already by itself, it's already done, those are my two answers. So you just put 10 and negative 10, mm -hmm. you don't have to put y is equal to that? No, normally it tells you y equals and then you have to fill in the box mm -hmm. or just has the box and ask you for the solutions and that's it. Now here, is this one ready for me to figure out which case it is? Mm -mm. I still have to get rid of this, right? So how? Divide, divide. divide again, yeah. good. And then I get the U in the bars by itself, and what do I get on the right-hand side? Zero. Zero. Yeah. So then this is which case? The zero, the positive, or the negative? The zero, the first one? Mm -hmm. So then I only have to worry about the inside equaling zero. zero. Because there's no such thing as positive zero and negative zero, right? It's the same thing. So that's why I only have one equation to solve. But it's already solved, isn't it? So zero is the answer. Okay, let's look at this example. How do I get the bars by themselves here? Right, this is okay. something plus 15, okay. right? Okay. So in this case, yes, you do minus the 15. That's not multiplying like the previous ones. Okay. So we get the little y bars by itself. And over here, now we have three? three. Positive three. Mm -hmm. yeah. So then that's the case where I have to do the two, right? Yeah. So you have the inside equal to three itself or the inside equal to negative three. And since y is already by itself, my equations are already done. Those are my two answers. They will grow. Eventually, I won't be done as soon as I peel it apart. I'll have to keep working. For this problem, how do I get the x bars by itself? Divide by five. Mm -hmm. x equals negative 10. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. When you have bars oh, equal right. to a that negative, is, you're right? You yeah. Bars cannot ever equal a negative. So there's no solution. What about the last example? How do we get those bars by themselves? Subtract uh, 9. Mm -hmm. So we get the bar w equal to what? Yeah, negative 1. And so then what's the answer? Again, bars equal to a negative means no solution. This is really weird. On the camera, you don't see anything on my paper, but on my paper, like from my view, I can see all the previous writing I did on this page <laughs> before I erased it all. But it's weird, the video doesn't pick up any of it. That's a good so you don't see all a bunch of scribble, but <laughs> okay. Here we go. So they're getting harder, right? So this is a different topic. This one is a problem type two. I told you there's like three or four of them. So this is problem type two. Now the bars are already by themselves here, aren't they? So I don't have to move anything around first. It's already ready to go to figure out which case it is. Which case is this one? So no solution, correct? Yeah, because yeah, you have the bars yeah, equal to a negative. Three, so, no solution. so no solution. That one was nice. Really short, simple, right? You just have to recognize it. 
Here, though, you have the bar is equal to a zero. When that happens, we're supposed to take the inside and equal it to zero. Because the only way that that can happen is if what's inside is, in fact, zero, right? But here, I've, I can't just say V equals zero, can I? Because the V is not solved for. So I have to keep solving. So first you minus your 12 over, then you divide by your two, and you get negative six. So when V is negative six, if I plug that in there, I get negative 12 plus 12, which is zero, isn't it? Okay. But this is my answer, the negative six. What V will make that statement true? Only if V were negative six, right? And you can always check them. You can always plug that number in there and see if you get a number that when I take the absolute value, I'll get zero. This one's different. This is the longer one, right? The bars are by themselves. And I see that the right-hand side is a positive. So I immediately already know I need to take the inside and equal it to seven itself or the inside equal to negative seven. I have to do that. But I have two answers, don't I? Mm -hmm. So how do I work on the first one? You know, subtract five from both sides. Mm-hmm. <laughs> two y equals uh, two. Mm-hmm. And then divide by two. Mm-hmm. Y equals one. Mm -hmm. Can I just automatically say the other answer is going to be negative one? No. No. Because when you work this out, it's not negative one, right? So you have, there you got one answer, but you can't just assume what the next one's going to be, okay? You have to work this out. What happens here when I minus five? Yeah, it's going to become negative 12 on the other side. Uh-huh. And then when you divide by two? It's going to be negative six. Negative six, which is not the same as negative one, right? So you have to work them both out. So I get two answers, one and negative six. And again, you can check them. If I were to do, well, those you can do in your head, kind of. It's not too bad, right? What's two times one? Two. And then plus five? Seven. And what's the absolute value of seven? Seven, seven. right? Yeah. Now, if I plug in negative six, what's two times negative six? Negative 12. And negative 12 plus five? And what's the absolute value of negative seven? seven, positive, seven. positive seven still. So you can check them to see if they're right. Okay, how many more? We have, there are four of them. So here's another one. And they're getting harder and harder and harder, right? The last ones, they're like really long, right? <laughs> so it's just more and more, more stuff on the outside, more stuff on the inside. Eventually, we want to get to a bunch of junk on the inside and a bunch of junk on the outside, right? <laughs> that way you have every kind of situation. So here, I have stuff outside the bars on every single one of these cases. So I can't just jump to the answers or to knowing whether to split it or make it equal to zero or saying no solution just yet. I can't identify the situation until the bars are by themselves. So for this first example, how would I get the bars by themselves? I would divide by three. Divide by negative, negative, three. Three. negative three. So that whole thing goes out, right? Yep. Then you still have bars. Mm -hmm. And then what do you have over here? Negative four. Negative four. So that one's the nice one, because what's the answer? Uh, U is negative two. No. Can the absolute value of something ever be negative? Oh, that's no solution, like uh -huh. said, okay, that's a no solution. So you have to recognize it. I mean, it's really easy if you do recognize it because then you don't have to do any work, right? You just write no solution. But you got to recognize it. Okay, so for this example, how are we going to get the bars by themselves? Uh, if I were to solve I would, I would, this, I mean, 
Would you divide first? No, I would take away fire from both sides. Correct. If you were just solving that, you got to get rid of the adding or subtracting. The key big thing to remember is remember when those rules that we covered for equations? Division is always the very last step, isn't it? The very, very last step. So don't divide by two first, because that should be the last thing you do to get the bars by themselves. Yeah, divide by the coefficient. So minus five first. I mean, if you just keep that in your head, when you're trying to get isolate something, divide is last. That would give me, what, 12? Yes. Then I can divide by the two. Yeah. And I get the bars equal six. Now that's a positive which means the inside can equal that positive number or, or it could equal the negative of that number. And both of those, to solve them, all I have to do is divide, right? So here I would get W equals 2, two and here I would get W equals negative two. negative 2. And so those are my two answers. And you can check them. You plug them in there, see if it all works out. Okay, this example, how do I get the bars by themselves? <laughs> Bless you. Uh, subtract three. Mm -hmm. So we get the bars equal to what? Zero. Zero. And then in that case, I only have to worry about one equation, right? Yep. The inside equal to zero. And how do I solve that equation? Divide by four. Mm -hmm. So then I get V equals... Zero. Zero. And so zero is my answer. Now this one. How do you get the bars by themselves? Divide by seven. Mm hmm And so what number do you get on the other side? Sixty uh, nine. Nine. Mm-hmm. And then it's positive, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. So that's the one where you have the two equations. B minus 4 equals 9 and B plus 4 equals... No, the number changes the oh, sign. Oh, the number changes. Because oh, remember, the inside can be 9 or the inside could be negative 9. And you'll still get positive 9 at the end. So then here, how do I solve these equations? Uh, add 4 to both sides. Mm -hmm. four. And the same over there. Yes, so you don't get 1, 4, no be positive five? Nope. Oh, no. What's nine plus four? Oh, that's uh, 13. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. And then negative nine plus four? That's negative five. Negative five. And you'll know because if you check them and you you said it was positive five, when you go to check it, it's not going to yeah, work, work out. Okay. So then that'll be like, oh, I did something. Maybe I got my signs messed up or something. <laughs> Just double check. Don't ever erase everything. Just look at it. <laughs> I have people do all the work and then they get it wrong and they erase and I'm like, no, 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 just put an X or go look at it and try to find your answer. Um, okay, good. So these are the big ones. This is the problem type four now. So you got stuff on the outside and stuff on the inside and you're doing the same thing. Remember, the key thing is, is get the bars by themselves before you start tearing things apart. Okay. So this one, how do I get the bars by themselves? I subtract 20. Mm hmm. So I still have the 4 there. And now I have what on the other side? 0. 0. Then how do I get rid of that 4? You got to divide by 4. Mm hmm. So I still have the bars. 0. But 0. And so when it's 0? Yeah, there's going to be the 2x minus 4 equals 0. Mm hmm. And then how do I solve that? Uh, add 4 to both sides. Divide by 2. Mm -hmm. X equals 2. X equals 2. And it's just one answer. Now for this example, how do we get the bars by themselves? Subtract 26. Mm -hmm. Negative 
negative 21. What do I do from here? Oh, oh, that's a no solution. Yes. The bars <laughs> cannot come out yeah. negative, right? Yeah. Good. Up, baby. Yep, yep, yep. Good. Okay. Next one. What do we do first? Subtract 15. Mm-hmm. So I have four, X minus two, and then that's what? 60. 60. Yeah. What do I do next? Divide by four. Mm -hmm. What's that, 15? I think so, yeah. yep. Now what do I do? So it's going to be X minus two equals 15, mm -hmm. and X minus two equals negative 15. Correct. And then you're going to... Add by add two. Mm-hmm. Same over there, right? But here I get x, x equals, equals seventeen. And over, over here. Side, you get x equals negative thirteen. Correct. And so those are your two answers. Good. And it doesn't matter what order you put the answers in. Alex will take as long as they have each one has the right sign, Alex will take them whether they're it's seventeen and negative thirteen or negative thirteen and seventeen. Okay, so we just knocked out like five topics already. So let's see what else they've got here. Oh, this is interesting. It's different, right? All the other ones are just equal to a number, weren't they? This one you have the absolute equal to another absolute value, okay? It's sort of like the same thing. It just gets a little weird, okay? You still do what you did before. You take the inside of the one on the left, and you equal it to what's on the inside to the one on the right. Then you've got that or. And then the same thing on the left-hand side. On all these equations, did we ever change what was on the left-hand side when we split it? No. It was exactly the same on the left-hand side, right? Yep. The only thing that changed signs was what was on the right-hand side. Uh -huh. yep. So all we have to do is worry about changing the sign of what's on the right-hand side. The best way that they explain how to do that is put a negative and put this on the inside. Some people don't write this step. They just take this stuff exactly as it was and then they write the opposite signs. So negative three Y and positive five. Those are the same exact things. So whether you write the negative outside the parentheses or you just jump straight into changing all the signs, it's the same thing. You're still doing the opposite of that second bars right now really there's four cases I just want to explain the logic that's going on here tell me this just if I pretend they're numbers let's pretend you got five are these equivalent to each other yes right yeah that inside part could this equal that inside, inside part yes, what about if I have this are those equivalent to each other yes yes, yes. yes. Oh. These are the two cases there. Notice that I have the inside exactly the same and that inside exactly the same. Over there, on the other side, I have the first one exactly the same and then the one on the right is opposite, right? Negative, yeah. There's two more cases though, except they're kind of like repeats. So here I have negative and a positive. Isn't this the same thing as that? Yeah. It's literally just like written just like this, terminology. right? Yeah, just flipped terminology, just flipped it. Okay, yeah. so instead of solving both of these, you just pick one and you don't have to solve them both because they're both gonna have the same answer, okay? And then what about this case? If right? Make absolute value, they're both gonna be five. Mm -hmm. They're yeah. both gonna be five. So if I were to make them both negative, what happens when they're both negative? If I divide everybody up by a negative, aren't I going to just end up with well, 5 positive, and 5? Yeah. Which is the same as solving that one. Oh, okay? okay? So there are four different situations that are going on, but we're only worried about two of them because those two are equivalent to the other two. Okay? So you don't have to make them both negative, and you don't have to make this one negative. You just keep the one on the left the same and only change the one on the right. Do it exactly the same and then the opposite. Okay? And you should be able to solve them from there. Here though, what do I get? What? If I try to solve this equation, so that inside and this inside exactly the same, what would be my first step to solve this equation? Add four to both sides? Sure. 
mean, you saying that because you agree, or you, I'm going to look silly in a minute? No, you're good. That's <laughs> not. <laughs> because, I mean, you like, sure. Yeah. Okay. That's not what I would have done first, but that's okay. just me. But you're okay. As long as you're not breaking okay, any rule, so you're allowed to choose which path you take, right? Yeah, you're going to get the same way, place. Then what you're going to do, you got to add a negative one? I mean, no. Add a positive one? No. If you move the constants to one side, you need to get the variables to the other side. Remember, the idea is, is you want letters on one side and numbers on the other side. Subtract three. So subtract 3y so that that 3y can move over here, right? Oh, okay. okay. But when I do that, I have the negative 1 all alone. Yeah. But what do I have here? You got a negative no. y. Negative 1y? If I have three yachts and I take away three yachts, what do it's I have left? None. I have nothing, right? Have nothing. So it's zero. Good. Okay, where does this theory about when you still you subtract... Because before, like even on my exam, mm -hmm. I know on one of them W's, it was like that, and I didn't write a negative. So when does this imaginary one stay in the play? Or when does If that... you get one. So like if I had 4W minus 3W, then I still have 1W left, right? Oh, okay. So you you're write W, a, yeah, right? So you're writing it in. Okay, I see what but you're But if saying. you're take, you have but three and you're taking away all three, you have nothing. You ain't got nothing left. Right. Okay, yeah. I mean, you could put zero W, but zero W is just zero. What zero times anything, no matter zero. what W zero. is, is still going to be right. zero. zero. Okay. But is that true? Because whenever your letters go away, you basically have two options. The answer is either no real, no all real numbers or no solution. It depends on whether that statement here with just numbers is true or false. Is zero equal to negative one? No, no. this is false. Yeah, that's false. Which means there's no solutions here. But don't box it because that just means there's no solution to this half of the problem. Oh, you still got to bust up the other We half. still have to figure out what's going on in the second half. Because if there is an answer over here, then we have an answer, right? No solution is like there's absolutely none. So if this one comes out no as well, then you can box no solution, okay? But over here, what do you do first to solve? I'm going to add, I'm going to add four. Sure. I just said the same thing yeah, again. Yeah. <laughs> we got negative 3y plus 9. Uh-huh. And then what do you do next? You're going to add 3y. Correct. And so then we get what? 6y. 6y. Equals 9. Mm-hmm. And then what do we do? Divide by 6. Divide by 6. And so whether you say 3 halves or you say 1.5, it doesn't matter to the computer? Which one? Unless it literally says type in a fraction. Okay. okay. But most times they don't. And I just reduced it. If you don't know how to reduce, you can always just put the fraction in your calculator, hit enter, and it reduces it for you. Um, but we do have an answer, right? So when we box our answer, we need to make sure we don't say that this is the answer. This is only the answer to half of the problem. So will Alex ask you for that half? or ask It you? wants all the answers. So if this one had answers and this one had answers, I'd be putting them all with commas, but right? But since the, what I'm saying, because so will Alex tell you, ask, um, give you the option to say no solution for this half? It will, no. It won't it's you only going to ask you the ask you final that. answer. It's final either answer. all no solution, okay. one solution, solution, or two solutions. Okay. okay? Yep. So it's those are your three options. Here we, this one didn't give me one, but this one did, so I have one. Sometimes, though, you end up with this one works and that one works. I have two answers. And sometimes you might get no solution for both. And so you just have no solution. So it all depends. So if you get no solution and no solution, that's when you say the answer is no solution, right? But if you get an answer here, and you get an answer here, then that means you need to put both answers in your final response. Okay? Unless it's the same number, but I highly doubt that. Like if you get five and five, then the answer is five, right? You don't need to say it twice. And then you have our case where you get one no solution, one has an answer, so you only have one answer. Okay, let's see, what is this? Okay, so now they want us to graph them. Now I noticed that in your, first thing you need to know is what is the basic shape of an absolute value. 
And the basic shape of an absolute value function looks like a V like this, okay? And it could be opening upward, it could be opening downward, it could be really, really narrow, like really skinny, or really, really wide, okay? So it just depends on what else is happening in and outside the bars, okay? That'll make it look different. Sometimes the little V, the little, they call it a vertex, the little corner, right? That little corner's called the vertex. Sometimes the vertex is at the origin, sometimes it's all the way to the left, to the right, up, down, wherever, right? So depending on what you're doing to the problem, that's what's gonna make this little V move around or flip upside down or open and close, okay? Now I noticed that in your Alex, in order for you to graph the V, there is a button that has a V on it, but in order to do that, you have to have the vertex, and then I think you only need one point, but it asks you for two more points, okay? So if you have the vertex, you need one more point to the left of that vertex and then one more point to the right of that vertex, okay? In order to graph it inside Alex. Um, so what we'll do is we'll make tables, but we just have to make sure once we find that vertex, and I'll show you how to identify it. Once you find that vertex, um, make sure that you're using one number on each side of the vertex, okay? So if we make a table here, Pick some x values. It doesn't matter what x values you pick, but after a while you'll figure out you need to try certain things. But what do you want to try? Let's go three. Three? So then when you plug that in, you get what? What's the absolute value of three? Three. Uh-huh, and then what's five times three? Fifteen. Fifteen. So my y value is fifteen. Pick another x value. Should we go big or stay small? It will help you if I tell you. Or stay odd and even. Absolute value of x all by itself. If I draw it on the, the number plane, it and has a vertex at the origin right. and then it goes up. Okay. Okay. So maybe we should start by trying to center our numbers around the origin. So if you picked three pick all the other guys too. Okay. So maybe 2, 1, yeah, 0, yeah, negative 1, one negative right. 2, negative 3, right? And then we'll see how we can identify the vertex. So what happens when I plug in 2? What do I get? You get 10. Mm -hmm. What about when I plug in 1? 5. And when I plug in 0? Zero? 0. 0. What happens when I plug in negative 1? You're going to get a positive 5. Yes. Notice how zero is here and I have five and I have five. Mm -hmm. That tells me that zero is my vertex. When you start seeing that symmetry, okay? The, the numbers go back to being They're the gonna same. start being the same. Cause they're gonna cause go back to yeah, because that's gonna be absolute value is gonna be 10. Mm -hmm. I mean, because a, a negative two is gonna be positive. Mm -hmm. And then negative yeah. three turns positive, be 15, makes yeah. you 15. So you okay. see the symmetry now? Yeah. So you got that zero Y value in the middle and then you've got fives and tens and fifteens, right? So as soon as you start seeing the numbers going back to the other numbers, that's when you know you've identified the vertex. This particular problem is easy because they're all gonna be centered around zero. But I promise you when you get into some of the other ones, they're not gonna be centered at zero, okay? And so you're gonna need to be able to see where that vertex is so you know how far you gotta go, okay? Um, now let's see. So I could pick these three points and that would be enough for Alex to graph because I have my vertex here and then I have one point, one point to the right and one point to the left. So if I were to draw this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, all Alex needs is the vertex, which is zero, zero, and then a point to the right, one and five, and then a point to the left, which is negative one and five. Oh, okay, you're reading that chart the same. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Now I had something. Okay. Here we go. So then you just draw this. So that's the vertex, so that's the little corner. It's just going to go up like that. 
and then over here the same thing it's gonna go up like that imagine my lines actually went through my dots I learned this trick you just make your dots fatter <laughs> and then it looks like it went through right okay but you need those three dots in order to click that little V button and Alex graph it for you okay so now when we try this one we kind of already have that hint that we know it's gonna be centered around zero so just try zero. I would always suggest using these numbers, negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two. And if this doesn't tell you what the vertex is, then start making up more numbers, okay? So this is just my suggestion. Always do those five X values. And if you're not getting the vertex from them, then you can go figure it out. And I'll actually explain later how you know where the vertex is gonna be too. because it's gonna come up in one of the topics. And it's gonna be the same strategy when we get to the square roots, because the square roots are weird too. So here, if I plug in negative two in there, what do I get? Negative four. Mm-hmm, because this one will turn positive, right? right. The but then times that, right. correct. What about when I plug in negative one? Negative two. Mm-hmm. Just FYI, because y'all have this black calculator, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. You can type that in there. You type negative two, okay, negative two. and then hit the times button. Times. And then hit this math button right Ooh, here. Look, no. Math. Oh, okay, where it says matrix above it? Yes. Okay, hit math. And then you go to the right where it says number. Okay. And then you see how it says abs right there? Yeah. And it's eight. already highlighted, so just hit enter. And notice little bars in there for you mm. <laughs> oh, that's sweet. and then you could plug in whatever number right I'm plugging in what negative one this time yeah. and then I can hit enter and it does it for me I could even instead of having to push all those buttons again you can go up and highlight what you just previously entered okay. and if I hit enter what it does is it copies it for me but I'm still in the edit mode because I haven't actually told it to compute yet Okay, so I could go back here and I can type in zero and delete that extra number. And then now I can hit enter again and then plugging in the next number. And then I can go back up, highlight, hit enter to copy, go plug in my one, hit enter to compute. Then I can go back up and highlight, hit enter to copy, edit that two, and then hit enter to compute. And it gives me negative four. Okay, so you don't have to keep typing it all over and over and over again, right? There's another way to do it. It's going to take longer. But when you get to college algebra and you start getting into these really, really, really long polynomials, um, it's not as easy as just highlighting and changing the numbers. So there's a whole other way to do it later. Okay, but I'll show that to you later. Right now, this is easiest. Okay, but you see the symmetry on the y values again, right? You have like zero, the negative twos, the negative fours, right? So zero is my vertex again. It's all centered around that. The y values are centered around the zero. So when I go to graph this, all I need is the vertex and a point to the left and a point to the right. It doesn't even matter which one. I could pick the top one and the, the middle one here or the middle one here and the bottom one there, the two top and bottom or the two middle right there. It really doesn't matter as long as you have one point on the left and one point on the right. But my vertex, I definitely have to have zero, zero. And then let's see, one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two. So which one do you wanna put on the left? Negative two or negative one? We go negative one. Negative one, and then how, where do I move from there? Down negative two. Mm-hmm, so right here. Yep. And then to, for the right side. You're gonna go positive one. Positive one. And you're gonna still go down. Down negative two. two. Yeah, so mm -hmm. it's gonna be open at the bottom. Yes, so it's gonna go that way. So in Alex, it's gonna, once we get those two points, it's just, we click on it, and it's gonna grab Right, that once vortex. you put the vertex in the left and right, it'll automatically it put the little the V. Mm -hmm. You just have to click on the little V graph okay. and it'll do it.
Okay, now I'm not sure why they have these in the middle. I just went according to the order that Alex had on there. So this is next, even though it has nothing to do with absolute values. And there's still more absolute value stuff, but this is in the middle for some reason. Okay, so this one talks about graphing a cubic function, okay? And it tells you this in the description of the problem, okay? There's a little graphing icon. That's all I tried to do here was just em emulate the little graphing button, okay? But before you can click that button to draw the curve, you need to follow these directions. It says you have to use five points in order to click that button. And it says with one x equal being zero and then two with negative x values and two with positive x values. So they're telling you exactly what to use in your chart. They're telling you you have to have zero, you have to have two negatives and two positives. So pick two negative numbers to plug in. Negative one and negative two. Sure. And then just to be symmetric, we'll pick the positive versions, right? One and two. But it, you have to do what it tells you to do here. Sometimes it's not zero, it's another number and you have to pay attention, okay? So if I plug in negative two in there, let's see, three fraction four, go to the side, plug in negative two raised to the third. It gives me negative six. Now if I go copy it and change that to negative one, I get negative, I'm gonna use a decimal version, 0 0.75. Then let's go copy that thing again and now change it to zero, but let's get rid of the extra. Oops, what did I do? Zero and delete that, there we go. I get zero, one, positive 0.75, and then finally two and I get six. So this one has some symmetry too, but just FYI, the basic shape of a cubic, I call it a chair or squiggly, but it looks like this. It looks kind of like a parabola on the right-hand side, but then it goes in the opposite direction on the other side. So you see how it kind of looks like a little chair, right? Or a little squiggle. And it could do the other way. It could go up on the left-hand side and then down on the right-hand side. So that's the basic shape. Now, just FYI, it could do this. Okay, it could have bigger humps, right? Instead of just being so smooth like it was before. So it could do that. But the important thing is to know that it'll go down on one side and up on the other, or vice versa, okay? And it's a curve. Notice there's nothing straight edge about it. It's curvy, okay? So when you see cubic function, don't try to draw straight lines on your paper, or anything, right? It's gonna be curvy. So let's see here, let's try to draw this. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, one, two, one, two. Okay, so negative two and negative six. Negative one and negative 0.75. So not quite to negative one, a little bit above that, right? Then zero, zero. Then one and just before you get to positive one and then two and positive six. Now in the computer though, how are you gonna enter this point and this point? There's a button in the computer that looks like this, right? It has like a little X. If you click on that button, it opens up a window and it asks you to type in the point, okay? So if I click on this button and I open it up, I can type in negative one for X, negative 0.75 for the Y, mm -hmm. and then hit enter or plot I think it says you click plot and then it'll put it on there right there and you do just do that for any time you, you could do it for all of them if you wanted oh, to okay. Okay. I only do it whenever either my hands not helping me line up stuff like it's not working for me <laughs> then I'll use that button 
or if I get fractions or decimals, yeah, I use that button. Mm -hmm. Later on, you might get square roots that don't simplify, and you'll use that button as well. So it just comes in handy later. And then remember, it's curvy, right? So this is going to be curvy going up, and this is going to be curvy going down. Don't try to make it straight. It's supposed to be curvy. But all you do is plot the five points they told you to use, and then click this little thing here, and it'll draw it for you. Okay. Okay. I don't like this is here, but it is completely off track. <laughs> it's just thrown in there. It's an application problem with the linear function. So it's line stuff, which is the stuff we were doing in 410, right? So I guess just trying to bring it back and trying to make sure we kind of still have it all together. So here it says, suppose that the weight in pounds of an airplane is a linear function of the total amount of fuel in gallons in its tank. When graphed, the function gives a line with slope of 6.3. I'm sure that's gonna be important, so I underlined it. With 50 gallons of fuel in its tank, the plane has a weight of 200 and or 2,215 pounds. What is the weight of the plane with 17 gallons of fuel in its tank? So we've got this point here. They didn't draw a dot, but there is where they meet is a point, right? What are the coordinates of this point? According to the picture they gave me. What is the point of that? What is the coordinates? Uh-huh. You're supposed to put the x value first, right? This is like the x, and this is like the y. So what is the x value here? It has a dotted line, right? What is the x value? 50. 50. Uh -huh. And then what is the y value? 2215. Two, mm -hmm. Those now, could be coordinates? Mm -hmm, that's the coordinates of that point. Remember, any point, any spot has coordinates that tell you its location, right? But it wants me to tell them what's happening at 17. So 17 is like over here somewhere, isn't it? I can't just guess, especially can't guess when I don't know, I don't have any markers or anything, right? So I don't know what this Y value could possibly be when I don't have any units, nothing, okay? The only way to figure out what this could possibly be is if I know what the equation of this line is, then when I plug in 17, won't I get that y value? You should. But I would have to know what the equation is, right? And we have a way to figure out how to write equations. We have to use this formula. Remember that formula? That formula will help me to develop an equation. And then once I have that equation, I can just plug in the 17, okay? So do I know what the slope is, the M? Yes. What is it? Six, six over three. 6.3, 6 6 yep. 6.3, yeah. And I do have coordinates X1 and Y1. X being the 50, and Y being this 22.15. And you could simplify it if you really, really wanted to, but I don't even care what the equation is because that's not what they asked me for, right? What they asked me was, what's happening at 17? So I could just use it exactly the way it is and just plug in 17. And so this is an order of operations problem. What do I have to do first to figure out this number? Yeah, Other than type it in your calculator. Take care of the parentheses. Mm -hmm. yeah. You could type the whole thing in your calculator, but I'm not going to. I'm going to work it out. So I get negative 33. Plus it's good practice for your order. Then that times 6.3. And then if I finally add that number, 
I get 2007.1. So apparently that's the number that would be here. So there's 17, the number here would be 2007.1, okay? So that would be the weight of the tank if it has 17 gallons of fuel in its tank. So what units would I put? It already has it there in the computer, but if it didn't, what units should this be? That should be in what, in gallons? The Y values oh, are, pounds. In, sorry, are pounds. in pounds. So good. But normally Alex already has the word pounds there. They okay. just ask you to type in the number, okay? And so this is the application problem. So if you see that topic, right, application with the linear function, remember you gotta get the equation first before you can plug in the number they give you. So use the information on the graph to get the first point and then go find what they tell you to find. Okay. So now more graphing, but now we're getting into the square root and we're getting into the cube root, okay? We've already done a cube and we've already done the absolute value. So they're getting into some more functions here. They're just kind of introducing all the different kinds of functions. So this one, it says table for a square root function. So they will give you both the function and they will give you the chart with the X's already plugged in, okay? Your job is literally just to plug those numbers in and give, fill out the rest of the chart, okay? So if you plug in two, and I can do this in my calculator. If I do square root and I do two minus three, what does it tell me? Domain error. Uh-huh, so this is error. I think on the computer, what you select is undefined. How did you put up that uh, square root sign? Did you have to hit the second first? Um, yes, I had to hit second and then the X squared button to get the square root. Yes, mm -hmm. Now I do three minus three, I get zero. So I would type in zero. Then again, seven minus three, I get two. And finally, 12 minus three, and I get three. So that's all you're doing for this one. This one's not bad, right? It's a nice one. Could probably knock it out real quick, a minute or two. You're just plugging in the numbers and filling in the chart, okay? Here, it's the same thing. It's just written in the weird notation again. Remember with the F, right? What's inside the parentheses again? An X value or a Y value? An X value. So this is the X value. So then just plug that in for the x value, right? So f of 64 is going to be the cube root of 64 plus 5. Now pay special attention to where that bar stops. Because when I try to type this in my calculator, i got to make sure that that bar doesn't cover things that it's not supposed to cover. Does the 5 look like it's underneath the bar? No. So when I put it on my calculator, I have to make sure that that five is not underneath the bar. So I'm gonna use this button here, but in order to put a three inside that little box, I have to type that number first. Then I can hit second in that box and see, notice how it put the little three up, right? And now I can plug in 64, but look what happens if I just put plus five. It's, all under it's inside, right? Yeah. So let's delete that and get outside. Hit the right arrow to get outside the root and then put plus five. Notice the five's not underneath anymore, right? This is what's the same as what's on my paper. So now I can hit enter and I get nine. Wow. The cube root of 64 is four. Four times four is 16. 16 times four is 64, okay? Now let's do that again, but we need to plug in what this time? 216. Negative, negative 216. 216. So we're going to plug in negative 216 and just make sure that our 5 is outside. So do the 3 because that's what kind of root I have. Then second the square button. 
this button with the literally the squares. Type in negative 216. Hit the right arrow to get out of that little house and then do plus five. So that should look exactly like what's on my paper. And hit enter, you get negative one. Make sure you put the correct answer next to the correct label, okay? F of 64 is nine and F of negative 216 is negative one. So make sure you're putting the answers in the right spot. Because I think all Alex does is do this. And then it has the box, right? And then it has the box. So make sure you're putting your nine and your negative one in the correct spot. Okay. Here we have domains of higher roots. Ah, we talked about the domain of the square roots. We said when we had the domain of square roots, the inside had to be positive or zero, right? Do you remember that? When we had like the square root of x plus five or something, we said that the inside part had to be positive greater than zero or equal to zero, right? And then we solved it and we put it in interval notation. That's what we did the last time. This topic is gonna generalize what's going on with those square roots. That same thing that you do for square roots, that same property of a square root is the same for all even roots. So if you have an even number, as your little index, that's what those little tiny numbers up there are called. If that little index is even, then you're gonna do the exact same thing you do with the square roots to find domain, okay? When you have odd, odd little indexes, okay? There is nothing to do. The domain is automatically gonna be negative infinity to infinity. And the reason is, is because you can take cube roots of negative numbers. Didn't it just take a cube root of a negative number and gave me a number, right? Mm -hmm. It didn't give me error, but watch if I try to do the square root of negative 216. What does it tell me? Error, right? If you try to do the fourth root of negative 216, again, domain error. So it's only the even indexes that cause this errors. The odd indexes, it doesn't matter, because remember, you're multiplying three numbers. If they're all negative, don't you get a negative yeah, answer, right. right? So if you can do cube roots of, of cubes and any odd index, okay? So if you see these in here, immediately half of them, you're already gonna know the answer to, okay? So all the odd indexes, this guy here is an odd index, right? Yeah, so it's gonna be the negative, negative infinity to infinity. Automatically, you don't even need to work on it. It's just, that's just what it is. This one is even so when it's even you have to act like it's a square root okay so you have to take the inside and set it greater than or equal to zero solve that and then put it in interval notation like we did before okay and I keep saying the inside but the real word I'm supposed to use <laughs> is radicand so if you see in the explanation and Alex it uses that word radicand that means inside, inside the the house, okay? Index is the little tiny number, and the inside is called the radicand. So here if I solve, I'm gonna minus my eight over. Well, x should be uh, negative Oops, four. Oops, I did, just went straight there. Divide by two first, right? Yeah, well, sorry, <laughs> and then I'll get negative four. Negative four mm -hmm. And so then if I graph that, here's the negative four, how am I gonna draw that? You're gonna draw a solid circle. Solid circle. And then you're gonna shoot it to the right. Yep, and then how do I write that in interval you're notation? You're gonna make that bracket thing. Bracket. And then you're gonna say negative four, mm -hmm. and then positive infinity and beyond. And parentheses, right? And parentheses, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. yes, yes. Parentheses means and beyond, yep. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So it's just like the square roots, except just remember the odd ones, they're automatic. You could plug whatever you want in an odd root and you'll still get an answer back. 
Okay, this one is actually nothing new. All they've done is changed the notation. We know how to graph this, right? All they've done is change the notation. Notice that instead of calling all the equations y, they called it g of x or f of x or h of x. It doesn't matter the name, right? That's the only purpose of those letters is to name the lines, okay? So it's the same exact thing you've been doing before. How did you graph a line before? Where did you begin? If you remember this, Y in the limit, uh huh. So this number so it's gonna be negative five, it's gonna be your starting point. Mm -hmm. yeah. So one, two, three, four, five. Yeah. So that's my starting y intercept. Mm -hmm. And then what is the slope for this particular problem? One. One. So if my slope is one, remember you need a fraction because you need rise over run. One over one. One over one. So that means I'm going to rise because it's positive, and I'm going to always run forward, yeah. right? So I'm going to rise one and one. go over one. And then rise one more, go over one again. And I could keep doing it as much as you want, but you really only need like two points, right, to graph a line. And then you've got it, okay? You only really need to do it once. Once you have the beginning spot and you move over and up and over, you already have to pick the line and then it'll draw it. So there's really not much different. If it were a two, I would do two over one, right? Mm -hmm. What if it were a negative three X? What if it were negative three X plus five? My M would be what? That'd be three over one. Negative, negative three, three over, over one. one yeah. Which I still run forward, forward yeah. but which way do I go for the rise and for the rise? Do I go up or do I go down? Yeah. You go down because it's negative. Okay. Always run forward. The negative is only going to tell you whether to go up or down. Okay. So this one's the same thing, the exact same thing. Okay. They just put the funny notation, right? Instead of y equals, they put f of x equals. But you still graph it exactly the same. What am I beginning at? Positive four. One, two, three, four. And then from there, how am I moving? You gonna follow three? Mm hmm So one, two, three, and, and shoot, then shoot to the right, two. One, two. You got it. And then you should be able to click the little button to graph it. If you want, you could do it again, fall three, and then go over two. You should still land on the same line. So the only thing here is I just want you to recognize it's the same stuff, just with a different notation. Okay? Okay. So here they did the same thing. They're asking us to graph like they did before, but this one's got some more things going on with the absolute value. And remember what we need for the absolute value. To graph them, we have to have the vertex and then one to the left and then one to the right before you hit the little V button, okay? You have to have those three points. So this one is just X on the inside, isn't it? And we already know when it's just X on the inside, it's supposed to center around the origin, okay? So when you create your chart, you already know you can put zero in the middle. Now you just need one X value to the left of zero and one X value to the right of zero. What is an X value to the left of zero? Negative one. Mm-hmm, negative one. And if you get confused on left because my, it's, a, it's like this, right? <laughs> Just think, this is zero to the left, negative one works, right? And then to the right of zero, one, one. positive one will work, yep. And so you just plug those in. What is the absolute value of negative one? One. Times two, two. minus three, yeah. negative, negative one. one. Absolute value of zero? Zero. Times two, zero. minus three, negative three. Absolute value of positive one? One. 
times 2, two. minus 3. Negative 3. Mm -mm. 2 minus 3. Oh, 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 2 minus 3, that's a negative 1. Negative 1. Right. And it should be, right? Because it should be the center, and then it should be symmetric, right? So let's see, 0, 1, 2, 3. Then I'm going to go negative 1 and negative 1 and positive 1 and negative 1. And I definitely have a V-shape. So if I button, it'll just draw it for me. Are we always going to plug in our own um, yes. numbers for X and Y? Mm -hmm. It's okay. not going to tell you. But my hint is if it's X by itself, you already know it's going to center around, around. 0. Yep. Okay. okay. Yep. Notice this one does not have X by itself, does it? But I can like do some side work and figure out what it is going to center around. Or you could just look at it and see what's going to make it, what it's going to center on. What would X have to be to make inside the bar zero? Uh, what is it? Positive three. Positive three. So that is going to be my center. Now the inside can get really ugly, okay? So how do I figure out what that magic number is, where my vertex is, if this is really ugly, right? Just take it to the side and take the inside and equal it to zero and solve. And notice that if I take the inside, x minus three equal to zero, and I solve it, I get x equals to three, right? You just looked at it and knew that three would make it zero, right? But I promise you it's gonna get uglier inside there and you're probably not gonna be able to just look at it and know, okay? So you have to actually solve it. That's the center. I'm telling you, that's the center. <laughs> so, so when you go here, you wanna put three in there, but remember the rule, something to the left of three and something to the right of three. And if you have to, look at the graph paper and what the heck is to the left of 3 and what is to the right of 3. There's 3, right? What is to the left of 3? 4. 4 is not to the left. To the left? To your left or my left? Two. To the left. <laughs> oh. It's 2. It's 2. My fault. Okay. And then what is to the right? 4. 4. Okay. Good. So 3 always has to be your center. Mm -hmm. Whatever you get from this little side work, that's your center okay and then you just plug in those numbers so what do i get two minus three is what negative one and what's the absolute value of negative one positive one times a negative three negative three negative three what about this guy i'm pretty sure it's zero but what happens if you do three minus three zero what's the absolute value of zero zero and times negative three zero Now, 4. What's 4 minus 3? Positive 1. Absolute value of positive 1? Is 1. Times negative 3? Negative 3. Negative 3. So we've got 2 and negative 3, which is here. 3 and 0, and then 4 and negative 3. So yeah, it still makes a little V shape going downward. So make sure you do this to figure out what the what the center is, okay? So when they tell you to graph these, it's the same exact topic, graphing an absolute value equation in the plane, except this one is advanced, right? <laughs> So it's got more stuff going on. But you're still going to do the same thing. How do I figure out where the center is going to be on my chart? Uh, that starting point is 3? Nope. It is not 3 in this case, oh, in this problem. Okay, so Why is it not 3? Remember, to find center, take the inside equal to zero and solve. 
so, pull, pull that on out to the inside. So that's going to be positive 4. Uh-huh. So x equal to 4 is my center. So I'm going to put it in the middle there. 1, 2, 3, 4. And then what's to the left of 4? 3. And what is to the right of 4? 5. Five. Good. So then now when I plug in 3, now I'm going to get lazy here because it's a lot. So I'm going to do 2 math number enter. And I'm going to do 3 minus 4. Get over there, plus three on the outside. Does this look like it should look if I plugged in three for three x? For the value of three, four. Yep. Okay, so I'm gonna hit enter, I get five. Then I'm gonna copy that guy, and I'm just gonna change the three in the front to a four. And I get three. Then I'm gonna copy that guy again and change the four to a five and I get five. And isn't it symmetric, right? Look at the y values, right? Yep. So we have three and one, two, three, four, five. We have four and three, and then five and five. And it still looks like a V. What if you were to put a, a, a dot on your starting point at four, would that vortex be wrong? If you were to put the dot here? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Because mm -hmm. you have to figure out what the correct y value is for that four. Okay. Now, what about this one? What is going to be my center on my chart? Uh, negative two. Mm hmm. And you're starting to do it visual, which is great, because then you don't have to do all the math over here, right? But li literally, this is what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. Okay? So you have negative 2 here. Well, that means this guy negative 2. So who is to the left of negative 2? Negative 3. And then who is to the right of negative, negative 2? One. Negative 1. And so then I'm going to definitely cheat here. <laughs> so I'm going to put negative 4, math, number, enter. And I'm going to plug in negative 3 plus 2 get over there and put a minus five on the side. So it should be this, but with a negative three plugged in. And I hit enter and get negative nine. I'm gonna copy, change it to a negative two. And then copy and change it to a negative one. All right, I have a question. Sure. So. I say I notice when you always say the number to the left, the number to the right. Mm -hmm. I notice you always write your greater number up top and your lower number under the bottom. Mm -hmm. What if you just flip those? It doesn't matter. It's still because when you draw them, they're still going to be the same so, spots. Okay, copy mm -hmm. that. All right. It doesn't matter. You could have put the negative two first, and then the one negative one, and then the negative three. It really doesn't matter what well, order I they're you in. Needed two as being your center, though. Once you and out, it is. Okay. It will be in the picture, oh, but okay. it doesn't matter it doesn't which have, one you order because mm -mm. okay, you're just right. finding the Y values. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. It'll still all look the same. <laughs> it's just a matter of drawing this dot first or that dot first or this dot first. Who cares? Okay. They're all three going to be there. Okay. So this one's long. One, two, three, four, five six seven eight oh my goodness it's all the way down here nine so negative three and negative nine negative two and one two three four five and then negative one and negative nine so it's way down there it makes it really really narrow right When you get to college algebra, you'll learn something. I can tell you now, but it's you're actually going to do it when you get to college algebra. When you get to college algebra, you're going to learn that that little negative in the front is what makes it go downward instead of upward. That four is what makes it look skinnier versus like wider. Okay, this two here made it move to the left two, and this five here made it move down five. Those are called transformations. So you take an original graph and you move it around and do stuff to it, right? <laughs> Flip it over even. And those are called transformations. 
And so later, we will be able to graph this whole thing real quick without even having to do the little chart or figure out what's the yeah, center or any finding, of that. You're starting at endpoints and all of that mm -hmm. stuff. Wow. Mm -hmm. But you'll be able to just look at this and already know what it's going to look like, okay? Eventually, when it gets to college algebra, okay? You just have to your bars mean a V. This means it goes upside down. That means it's going to be real skinny. That's going to move it to the left. That's going to move it to the right. And you already know what it is, okay? So it's kind of cool. So it's like y'all just taking us on a, uh, uh, it's like y'all taking us on a carriage ride downtown. Uh-huh. Y'all just taking us <laughs> I mean, seriously. That's it's just like doing. baby steps. Yeah. You just got to like kind of get introduced to it at mm -hmm. first. And then you're like, oh, well, there's a faster way you could have done this. If you just notice this, this, and this. Okay. So yeah, it's, we'll see it again. Just okay. not yet. Okay. This one says graphing a function of the form and it's a square with a number in front, okay? And so basically, you're gonna see what happens if the number is positive and what happens if the number is negative, okay? Now we know the basic shape of a square is like a parabola, but sometimes it could also be upside down, right? So that's just the basic shape of it. It should look like a little U, like a valley or a hill, right? So you make your little chart here again, and another thing that's nice to know is that in the basic shape, it's always centered at the origin, okay? So then when you're trying to figure out like how many points, just make sure you use the origin and then pick some points around that, okay? So what could you pick around zero? Make one, negative one. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter if you put the smaller one on top, it doesn't matter. So if I plug in one, what am I gonna get? Three uh, x squared. What are we looking at for one for x? Mm -hmm. If you plug in one for x. Three. Mm -hmm. One squared is one times three is three. What about when you plug in zero? That's gonna be zero. Everything mm -hmm. on zero is zero. What happens if you plug in negative one? A negative three. No. What is negative one squared? That means a negative one times a negative one, which a is positive one. positive one times three is positive three. So then we got zero, zero. We've got one and three and then negative one and three. Now remember, it's a parabola. It's a squared, right? This is not an absolute value. But notice it looks like the same thing it does whenever I had an absolute value, doesn't it? Didn't it have three little, it's like it makes a triangle, mm -hmm. right? That's exactly the way it looked when I had the absolute value. But here, you cannot pick the V button. You need to pick the curvy button, okay? The curvy button or the parabola button, whichever one you see there, is the one you gotta pick. Because this should not be straight. It should be curvy. Easiest way to remember that is if you have a square on your x's, if you have any exponent on your x's besides one, it's gonna be a curvy thing, okay? In the absolute values, there were no exponents on any of those x's. So they were always straight lines, okay? Or straight Vs, right? Here, let's see. Let's do the zero again. And you could use one and negative one again if you wanted to. But what will you get when you plug in positive one? You're gonna get negative two. Mm -hmm. What do you get when you plug in zero? Zero. And what do you get when you plug in negative one? And then you just plot them and pick the button, right? So one and negative two, zero, zero, negative one and negative two. And remember it's a curve, not a V. things do I have? Oh my goodness. It's just going and going. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 
nine more. Oh, I'm gonna stop the video and I'm gonna put in a part two because this video is like really long. But 